So we pass now to a second presentation by Professor Dominic Markel, who is currently at the University of Innsbruck. And he will address the issue, the topic of historical criticism. How does this method of historical criticism operate on the text to meet the goal of biblical exegesis? Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Beret and the team of organizers are challenging me to address the field of historical criticism in 20 minutes. I kindly ask you, therefore, to bear with me if my presentation appears basic and thetic rather than adorned with the reasoning and argument that the issues that I touch upon would deserve. I leave it to your expertise to fill in the gaps that I have to leave. I have listed some bibliography in the handout as a background, and I hope that my reflection may be, despite its brevity, a starting point for discussion. I shall divide my remarks into three simple points on the history of historical criticism, criticisms of historical criticism, and the future of historical criticism. By way of introduction, I should ex explicate how I use the term historical criticism. It is not one method. Historical criticism rather is an umbrella term that refers to a broad hermeneutical approach that is diversified in a variety of historical critical methods such as textual criticism, today a major field in its own right, literary historic, uh, lit <clears throat> Liter liter literary historical models, such as source, form, redaction, and composition criticism, and historical work in a strict sense that is the reconstruction of history from ancient Israel to early Judaism and Christianity. As the term suggests, historical criticism's basic claim is to approach biblical texts from a historical and a critical perspective. Historical means we seek to understand texts in their historical context, the periods of their emergence, redaction, transmission, canonization, etc. Criticism refers to analysis, evaluation, and judgment. Specifically, it implies the distinction between claims made in the text and their historical accuracy. It thus complicates the theological notion of the truth of sacred scripture. Historical criticism is generally entangled in a conflict between a simplistic notion of truth and revelation. It is an intellectual challenge and a spiritual one for individual believers. And it has been a challenge to institutional religious authority. Authorities of Christian churches have tried to combat historical criticism to the varying degrees. In Orthodox churches, historical criticism hardly exists up to the present day. By way of analogy, historical criticism of the Quran is practically non-existent in mainstream versions of Islam. Against this background, it is by no means to be taken for granted, and indeed, quite surprising that the Roman Catholic Church has officially embraced historical criticism in the 20th century. It is the largest religious institution that has officially embraced and integrated this challenge of modernity. This brings me to my first point, the history of historical criticism. Instead of rehearsing its history since early modern humanism that has been laid out in detail in monumental works such as Hebrew Bible Old Testament, the history of its inter interpretation, and the new Cambridge history of the Bible, I shall concentrate on its recent history in the Roman Catholic Church, for which the Pontifical Biblical Institute has played a key role. The Institute was planned by Pope Leo XIII and founded by Pope Pius IX in 1909 under the auspices of anti-modernism, precisely to combat historical criticism as it was promoted in the 19th century, especially by Protestant scholars in Germany. In this historical context, the papacy felt the need 
to defend the truths of Catholic faith. The popes, however, trusted that rigorous scholarship in the spirit of the church would enable Catholic scholars to prove the historical reliability of the Bible against the claims of Protestant scholarship. After the first two decades of the Institute's operation, Father Augustin Beyer became the Institute's fourth rector in 1930. And the most recent uh, investigation of this part of our history is uh, Michael Pfister's dissertation. Beyer originated from southern Germany and thus knew Protestantism firsthand. As a scholar of the Old Testament, faithful to the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church, he defended the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. At the same time, he knew that serious intellectual engagement with Protestant scholarship was indispensable for the sake of the Roman Catholic Church's intellectual reputation and prestige. A certain breakthrough in this context was achieved when Beyer was invited to represent the Pontifical Biblical Institute and thus Roman Catholic exegesis at the Old Testament Conference in Göttingen in 1935. Here is the conference's announcement in JBL. While Beyer celebrated a certain victory on the German Protestant front, the Pontifical Biblical Institute came under heavy attack from anti-academic tendencies in the Italian clergy and episcopate. The most prominent proponent of this movement was Don Dolindo Ruotolo of Naples, who published under the pseudonym of Dain Cohen El. He produced lengthy spiritual commentaries on the Bible that involved typological read readings. I dug out one of the 30 volumes from our library. They are quite hidden. <laughs> At the same time, he openly attacked the scholarly endeavors of biblical scholarship especially at the Biblicum, accusing them of rationalism and infection by Protestant ways of thinking. Ruotolo was backed by some bishops and had a wide readership. After a lengthy process, the Holy Office put all works of Ruotolo on the index in 1940. Despite this prohibition of publishing activities, Ruotolo distributed an anonymous pamphlet under the title Un gravissimo pericolo per la Chiesa e per le anime, along among the Italian episcopate in May 1941, in which he warned against the danger of biblical scholarship as it was taught at the Pontifical Biblical Institute. Bea saw the earnest need to defend the Institute's work. The defense was brought about by a letter of the Pontifical Biblical Commission to the bishops of Italy in August 1941. While the commission had previously rejected historical critical views considered heretical and thus restrained biblical scholarship, the commission now defended scholarly work on the Bible against an anti-academic movement. This affair formed the direct background to the production of the encyclical Divino Afflante Spiritu, Bea's close interaction with Pope Pius XII was instrumental, and together with his Dominican colleague Jacques-Marie Vosté, he is considered the mastermind behind this text, which brought about the official recognition of historical critical methods by the Roman Catholic Church. The encyclical was published on 30th of September 1943, three weeks after the Nazi occupation of Rome had started. As is well known, this breakthrough was confirmed in the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution, De Verbum, and explicated in concrete terms of biblical scholarship in the Pontifical Biblical Commission's The Interpretation of the Bible in the Church in 1993. The latter document takes a broad view of biblical interpretation. It promotes historical critical methods as well as literary analysis approaches that use human sciences as well as contextual approaches. It rejects nothing but fundamentalism. 
What the Roman Catholic Church has achieved since the Institute's foundation by a decisive turning point of Divino Aflanti Spiritu is no less than a hermeneutical revolution. Our church's approach turned from an anti-Protestant apologetic stance towards a critical one that is able to collaborate with critical scholars of all denominations. And I'm glad that some representatives of other denominations are present in the room. The significance of this development cannot be overstated in my view. The Roman Catholic Church has embraced the intellectual challenge of modernity. Although historical criticism has been firmly established, it is also facing criticisms, which brings me to my second point. I shall formulate and address some of the challenges that have emerged since the 1990s, leaving aside fundamentalist and postmodern criticisms, rather concentrating on challenges that do engage with historical issues. A first challenge emerges from Jan Assmann's work. Traditional historical criticism has too narrowly focused on reconstructing factual history and literary history, neglecting the role of canonical texts as cultural memory, and thus losing sight of some of the most relevant aspects of the as text's function and meaning. But this challenge is, in my view, to be taken very seriously. The widespread interest and practice of splitting up texts into layers without asking about the meaning and function of the products of comp compositional history and con canonical collections impoverished interpretation and neglected the cultural role of texts and text collections. Asman's criticism does not delegitimize the historical critical endeavor. Memory studies rather enrich it by important concepts of cultural theory, which have inspired work on memory and historical method by authors such as Ron Handel, Dan Piosky, and Mari Leonard Fleckman forthcoming. A second somewhat related challenge has been voiced in the strongly growing field of reception history and reception criticism. Traditional historical criticism focused too narrowly on the text's supposed original historical setting, while un undervaluing the process of transmission and reception. Reception criticism has made us more acutely aware of the importance of transmission and reception during the formation of scriptural writings. The thresholds between textual development Canonization and reception are less clear cut than biblical scholars may long have implicitly assumed. This challenge does not question the need for historical criticism. It rather raises the level of complexity of the historical critical endeavor. We cannot limit ourselves to a supposed original setting of a text to determine its meaning but need to consider a long history of evolving layers of meaning. Another challenge was formulated by no one less than Josef Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, in his work, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, in 2007. Historical criticism should recognize its own limitations as it does not offer a full theological reading of the text. Ratzinger appreciates the necessity of a historical approach, but he claims that a theological interpretation needs to add a canonical reading that considers scripture in its unity, as well as the tradition of the church as stated in De Verbum. In principle, I think Ratzinger is right. Historical criticism is methodologically limited to historical questions and cannot do full justice in and of itself to the contemporary theological relevance of scripture for the faithful. Benedict XVI was probably right to point out that exegetes sometimes fail to do enough to address the need of the faithful for a theological interpretation. At the same time, it is a matter of nuance and determines the quality 
of biblical theology, how we use the results of historical critical research for theological evaluation. A serious challenge for historical criticism of the Pentateuch, which has been a primary field of biblical historical criticism for 250 years, was voiced by Konrad Schmidt in his presidential address at the International Organization of the Old Testament, IOSOT, conference last August in Zurich, where he offered, in my view, an excellent assessment of the field. Considering the state of research on a global scale, critical scholars have arrived, but at a minimal consensus. Diverging schools argue for diverse models of the Pentateuch's emergence. Despite significant efforts to bring scholars from different cultures together in conferences in Jerusalem, dialogue between the schools has basically failed. It seems, therefore, that scholarly discourses frequently move within the confines of accepted doctrines, sometimes failing to argue transparently. For many students and non-specialized readers, such theory appears hermetic and reserved to a small group of ivory tower academics, which reduces interest in the field and damages its reputation. These are serious issues. What then is the future of historical criticism? My third point. In my view, historical criticism has a bright future, and it has already started. There are many hopeful signs. I shall here propose four directions that I consider promising, the first three of which are much in line with Konrad Schmidt's presidential address. First, we should focus on hard evidence, such as extant manuscripts. In Pentateuch studies, for example, close scrutiny of its different versions, especially the Proto-Masoretic, the Samaritan, and the Septuagint Pentateuch, may yield more reliable insights into scribal redactions than purely hypothetical assumptions of such redactions. Indeed, Attila Bodor, an alumnus of our institute, is currently pursuing a project precisely in this field as an Alexander von Humboldt research fellow with Reinhard Müller in Göttingen. In the field of intertestamental literature, Fyodor Litvinow is working on with uh, Lauren Stuckenbrock as Wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter at the University of Munich. I am mentioning these alumni of our institute who are now working with eminent Protestant professors to remind us that we have gone a long ecumenical way in biblical studies since 1935. Second, historical critical research needs to work with comparative evidence from ancient Near Eastern and classical sources. Our institute has recently seen an outstanding conference in this line. Stones, tablets, and scrolls brought together historical, literary, and archeological expertise. This multi-perspective approach truly helps grounding our texts in their cultural environment. Jeffrey Zorn's re-evaluation of the archeology span of Mitzpah in the sixth century, for example, really allows us to consider the possibility of Judean scribes active at Mitzpah after the destruction of Jerusalem. Was the Book of Lamentations written there? Archaeology continues to yield highly relevant and precisely datable textual finds that help us grounding our texts in their historical context. I shall mention but one of the most spectacular examples of recent finds. In 2009, an almost intact copy of Ezehadan's succession treaty was discovered at Tel Tayinat, ancient Kunulua. The text had been known since 1956, when it was discovered at Kalhu, and it became clear that King Ezehadan had produced the text in 672 BCE, to have his officials swear loyalty to himself and his designated crown prince, Ashurbanipal. But a new copy from Tel Tainat provides an in situ archaeological context in a temple that makes it highly probable that the same text was exhibited 
in the sacred space of Jerusalem's temple during the reign of Manasseh. The text was likely well known and much hated among Jerusalem's elite. Among the similarities between the curses of Asahan's text and Deuteronomy 28, perhaps the most astonishing parallel is seen in the curses that invoke a climate catastrophe over the addresses, a sky of bronze and earth of iron. In combination with several other considerations, it seems very likely that this passage of Deuteronomy 28 was written later than 672 BCE by a person who knew Esarhaddon's succession treaty. Deuteronomy wants its addressees to adhere to the God of Israel, not the king of Assyria. Third, historical criti critical inquiry needs to integrate Here is a mistake. No. I lost a slide. Historical critical inquiry needs to integrate novel approaches from the human science, sciences. In my own work, for example, I found research on the transgenerational transmission of trauma very helpful. These research results on second and third generation descendants of victims and perpetrators of the Shoah and other instances of mass violence help us reconsider the theme of transgenerational punishment of sins in the Pentateuch or the aggressive stance against Babylon and its religion expressed in the early Persian period in Deutero Isaiah. Besides being hermeneutically relevant, this research may add new considerations for historical issues such as the date and redaction of the Decalogue and the historical emergence of monotheism. Fourth, historical critical research needs to convey its relevance to our churches and societies. A case in point was the conference Jesus and the Pharisees. It combined rigorous historical investigation in the Pharisees with reception history and its contemporary social and political relevance, the Pharisees' negative image in past and contemporary anti-Semitic anti stereotypes. The discussion thus attracted the interest of a wider audience. Some of us even had the chance, thanks to Joseph Sievers, to attend the premiere of the ober Amagau Passion Play at the director's personal invitation to witness how the Passion Play has managed to overcome anti-Semitic stereotypes. In terms of communicating the results of critical research to a non-specialized and lay readership, the Jerome Biblical Commentary for the 21st century and the Paulist Biblical Commentary are two major recent Roman Catholic contributions. We should be grateful to the editors, two of whom are in our midst. In sum, I believe historical criticism will thrive if it combines and integrates all methods of literary and linguistic analysis, such as narrative and rhetorical analysis, as well as any novel methods and insights of the human sciences that may enhance our understanding. Do we have any good alternative to historical criticism? If we choose not to work historically and critically, we will have to work without historical awareness and non-critically, that is, naively. At least in academic biblical studies, which is the realm of our responsibility, there is no good alternative to historical criticism, at least if we understand this approach in a wide and open-minded sense. Many thanks for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.